Hello, and welcome to My Sex Bio's May edition of Fucking Capitalism. My name is Pierce Delahunt. I am the facilitator for this ongoing series, and uh, you're watching May's edition. We're going to get into it. A couple disclaimers. Um, I am an activist educator. I call myself a social emotional leftist. I'm also very privileged uh, as a white hetero a uh, wealthy cis male. I am not profiting off of these classes. If you come, you will be asked to donate toward My Sex Bio. All those proceeds go to My Sex Bio's other staff and their operating expenses, um, not to me. And then <clears throat> this one uh, is going to get a little more medical. And I want to be clear, I am not a doctor. I do not study anatomy. So we're going to keep everything very basic. Unfortunately, there's plenty of uh, history to talk about how the fundamentals of what we're talking about are so corrupted by white supremacist, hetero, cis patriarchy, capitalist domination culture. And we'll get into that. Um, great. Without further ado, uh, this is May's Fucking Capitalism, which is patriarchy in genital science and genital medicine. We're going to uh, be focused on everything medically accurate. want to emphasize that. Uh, we are science grounded here. And at the same time, you know, we can have fun with it. While I was creating this, I was listening to Pussy Riot to help get me in the mood. Um, and I think the basis of everything we're going to be talking about can basically be summarized with one of their lines, don't play stupid, don't play dumb, vagina's where you're really from, which, uh, aside from some, uh, outliers is a medically accurate statement. Great. Uh, so first we're going to cover how patriarchy has influenced genital science and genital medicine, um, by part and then we're going to go through by timeline. So let's get it on. So some things to know about. There is the vulva versus the vagina, parentheses versus the urethra. Vagina and urethra, two different things. Urethra is the P passage. Vagina is the reproductive passage. And the vulva versus the vagina, that's the difference between the external and the internal genitalia. There is... Something that uh, at the bottom here, Dr. Harriet Lerner, uh, who's a clinical psychologist, she calls it psychic genital mutilation. What is not named does not exist. And the fact that we typically colloquially refer to the entirety of the female genitalia as the vagina, rather than acknowledging the external uh, genitalia of the vulva. Um, and in fact, like most medical textbooks will cover the internal you'll like i have you know a memory of the fallopian tubes that imagery in my head i don't think that i have ever seen in my own education in any health class or sex ed class depictions of the entirety of the external genitalia uh, including the labia majora or minora the clitoris and all that and that is a a psychic genital mutilation Reminder that May's My Sex Bio theme for the org is genital, female genital cutting and mutilation. Cool. Uh, so some things to be aware of there. Um, the condition of hysteria, the root of the word, comes from uterus. And the condition was named because it was believed that that condition was caused by the uterus wandering around. And... Uh, sometimes history presents us with metaphors that are almost too perfect, but the idea that a uterus does, that does not know its rightful place is creating uh, these uncontrollable women, uh, I, think, I think that that says a lot. And I do want to acknowledge that I, I will be slipping in and out of, I'm trying not to, but I'll be slipping in and out of language that is uh, cisnormative. Um, I'm, I'm working on that, but that these, these parts can be had by uh, people of all genders as well. But we will be focusing on these parts of the body. Thank you for uh, your patience in that with me. The hymen, uh, it is not a virginity detector. It's not something that you pop, which is like a very violent way to think about uh, that situation. And 
such tests in the US are still in fact happening. Uh, there was a, a case of a celebrity who take who took his daughter and in fact may still do that uh, for for hymen checks. That's not how that works. There's, there is no medical way to assess virginity. Uh, virginity itself is just a construct that cannot be medically detected in that way. And and I want to emphasize that a lot of people have these ideas that these are problems happening outside of the U.S., um, but there's plenty happening inside the U.S., and we'll, we'll get into that too. The clitoris, it exists. Uh, the G-spot exists. Vaginal ejaculation exists. The fact that like those things are controversial. Um, some, some of medical doctors still have doubts around this, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But it's it's a it's a really unfortunate statement of where things are today. Some things I want to emphasize: the clitoris it it is not a source of heightened pleasure necessarily. It can be, but I think when we constantly talk about it that way, it makes it sound like it's just a button, right? That you can just fucking just jab at like that, and that sounds fucking horrible and painful. So it's heightened sensation, uh, which means you know. Be gentle with it, at, at least at first, maybe later. Um, I don't want to get too much into that. But yeah, I think it's an important frame that it's sensation, heightened sensation, not heightened pleasure necessarily. The G-spot, it does exist. The controversy that I can see from within the actual medical community seems to be around the fact that it is a, a kind of general zone. Again, it's not a button. Um, and that there are different degrees of sensation for everyone. Some people aren't like super turned on by G-spot stimulation, and that's fine. Uh, it, it's still a spot that exists. And also the name of it is named after a, a, a male researcher, which like that, that's some more example of like people were familiar with the there there were people familiar with the G spot and we'll talk a little bit about that before a male researcher found it. So so that's a thing. <sighs> Moving on, uh, vaginal ejaculation. It also exists. Not everyone who has a vagina has vaginal ejaculation, but uh, if that if the, if it is still controversial. Uh, even in matters of the UK actually has a law that says as a matter of law that vaginal ejaculation does not exist. And the fallout of that is that any depiction in pornography or, or any footage of, uh, of vaginal ejaculation as a matter of law, therefore must be urine urination in in a sexual act uh which is considered legally according to the uk obscene um and is therefore that content is illegal um so that's some of the fallout from the idea that vaginal ejaculation does not exist and you can imagine you know a lot of stigma comes from that um and uh, you know representation matters, and it kind of again goes into this psychic genital mutilation, like the the fact that uh, these three key things that are parts of a body are even controversial in regard to their existence is a kind of of erasure of people, um, not to mention all the other myths around them. So that is just a very superficial breakdown of patriarchy as in, in genital science medicine as per the parts of the body. Now we're going to move into the history. And for that, we are going to be uh, borrowing heavily from this amazing book. I cannot recommend it enough. It's a comic book. It's, it's uh, not academic or heavy at all. It, it flies by because it's, well, the, the, I'll say the content can be heavy emotionally, um, but it is presented very uh, entertainingly and it's super engaging by a, I believe she's a Swedish uh, writer, illustrator, Liv Stromquist, uh, the vulva versus the patriarchy gives you a sense of uh, her angle. And so uh, the comic book's not written in chronological order, but I've kind of broken it down so that way. So that's what we're going to, that's the presentation we're going to go with right now. So some key things. Tribal nations before uh, 
white supremacist, heterosis, patriarchal domination, capitalist domination culture uh, took over. They were far more egalitarian. That's what the equal sign there means, which is not to say that every tribal nation uh, was not problematic in some way, just as a, a generality. Tribal nations, of which there were tens of thousands, were, were more egalitarian than today's culture uh, in regard to a lot of things, but especially sex and gender here. And they were far more familiar with the human body uh, at, a, at a general public level than, than we are today where we don't even know that the clitoris, G-spot, or vaginal ejaculation exists uh, as, as a general public knowledge. And it wasn't until after the uh, white supremacist civilizational order took over that we had, there. there's a couple different kinds of sexisms we're going to go through. There's the ancient sexism, which said that women are ruled by the body. Uh, and that's where their lasciviousness and lustfulness and uh, uncontrollability come from, because they're ruled by these these hormonal urges, whereas men are ruled by higher things like reason and, and are more noble. And that's why we're fit to govern, we, we men. And, and you'll see how uh, different iterations of sexism contradict each other. And, and that's where the vestiges of, of previous sexisms, which still play out today contradict each other and surprise the patriarchy is not an internally consistent ideology because injustice cannot be so that's ancient sexism then in 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 an appeal to worship and and the gods or god uh, religious sexism just relied on the fact that uh it was god's will um that women you know were not the the chosen gender in that way, which was arguably depending on specifics um, of, of history and, and uh, culture, the specific culture in question, it was more like a post hoc justification for the ancient sexism that was already there. And there are theories as to like how that came about too, including um, once we transitioned from more hunter gatherer culture into a totalitarian agriculture revolution, that that put a premium on upper body strength. So there, there's some ideas around that. But, uh, but yeah, then religious sexism came in and said, well, the reason it's like this is because it's God's will. And that had a couple things going on. One was that it put this stigma then on basically women with autonomy, including midwives, especially women who could encourage other women to have autonomy, to know their bodies. Um, and that's where a lot of the witch burning comes from, is this, and in that transition from feudalism to capitalism that uh, the book Caliban and the Witch talks about, which we've brought up in this uh, series before, excellent book by uh, Silvia Federici, who, who studies this aspect of history, that there was then a professionalization uh, and elitism put into the system of medicine as a whole, but especially in for our conversation, reproductive autonomy and and uh, women's health and, and those kinds of things. And and so then doctors became the gatekeepers, right? You couldn't have a healthy relationship with your body without seeing a doctor, uh, rather than being able to organize uh, amongst yourselves and be empowered in that way, so that you know you knew your body. And then that. Once, once that kind of transition happened, that paved the way for scientific sexism rather than uh, an emphasis on religion. Um, but if there, if we're moving towards scientific sexism, now you can't just say, well, it's God's will anymore. Now you have to point to quote unquote scientific differences uh, between the sexes and genders. So interestingly, during religious sexism, there was actually a lot more sense that the the female and male bodies were equal in terms of being bodies, but one was morally deficient or whatever. Whereas scientific sexism came along and then that needed to point to biological differences in order to justify the itself. And there's a huge overlap of scientific sexism with scientific racism. And uh, and that goes into vulvophobia, just the fear of of the external genitalia there. The big example of this is someone named Sarchi or Sarah Bartman, who died in approximately 1815, but she uh, is an African woman who was kidnapped by white human traffickers and showcased by one doctor in a, in a kind of human zoo situation. And 
they they particularly emphasize that like the the large vulva that she had that they claimed was typical of her people that that indicated that uh you know they're they're more animal in their in their biology and less human and actually after she died uh, a different horrible white supremacist doctor came along and uh stole her body and dissected it but with emphasis on her her genitalia as well as her her buttocks and wrote i think it was nine pages on her vulva and i think one sentence on her brain and her uh body and parts uh were actually in a museum in france until let's see if i can get the details here until i think it was 1985 yeah in the museum and that was just on display and that her body was just on display until 1985 and even after that she was not returned to her people until 2002 so the museum was just holding on to the body i believe that whole time so uh yeah really intense stuff i want to acknowledge that and it doesn't end there so we also have a strong anti-masturbation movement and that uh, goes right alongside genital cutting. You have probably heard of uh, Kellogg. Yes, that Kellogg. He was a doctor focused on uh, general well-being and promoting a healthy lifestyle. And so he tried to come up with cereals that were helpful to people. And that is the same guy who uh, regularly performed clitoridectomies and advocated what is essentially the sexual assault of children to make sure that they were not masturbating. And just just really, really bad. Um, there's a lot more that I could go into on him, but I have some uh, sources in, in the uh, notes for later. Um, but yeah, not a not a good dude. That's uh, that's Dr. Harvey Kellogg, serial man. Moving forward from there is we go into the 19th century, and this is more when the transition from seeing women as lustful to seeing them as asexual happens. And that's where we get the modern sexism, where women want emotions and men want the physical urges of sex. And uh, and that's why we get these contradicting ideas that women are hormonal, but also they, you know, don't care about like physical pleasure and just want feeling. So we you can see some of the contradictions coming about that are are more modern uh in in that there's uh uh again like all of these things interlap and uh, overlap and intersect right so we have overlapping with the the anti-masturbation and genital cutting we have a strong sense of transphobia uh john money another former doctor still alive uh performed a lot of uh surgeries on on intersex infants uh determining you know what what sex or gender they would be and and assigning that onto them without any kind of you know waiting until they can decide or anything like that not to mention oh i'm sorry i got confused uh john money yeah uh did the intersex surgeries the clitoridectomies are that ex doctor that i was talking about who uh that's Dr. Burt, who is the one who's still alive. And he performed, I believe it was uh, hundreds, if not potentially thousands of clitoridectomies, many without consent, and had no scientific basis uh, for this. He, it was just ideas he had, right, about how the, the genitalia should be if we wanted to maximize pleasure in the way that he thinks Need, we need to be having pleasure, which is to say, you know, missionary sex, man on top, and like never, no foreplay or like anything. And and when you force a human body to fit into like your idea, you're gonna commit violence. Um, that's and that's what he did. The clitoris again, the fact that it's controversial that it even exists. There are. I believe still medical textbooks today that do not actually show uh, the clitoris in in the diagram or 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 at least label it. But certainly, like the there's a one of the most popular medical textbooks that didn't show it until I want to say it was the 80s. Uh, I can double check that. But uh, but yeah, the 
the size of the clitoris was unknown by white medicine, because again, uh, people were familiar with this. If if you uh, cared to include their knowledge into your uh, pool of of data, but unknown by white medicine until 1998, which that it's an organ. Like the idea that we that there's would be an organ of the the of uh, traditionally thought of as men's bodies that we didn't even know the size of or or was controversial about its existence until 1998. That's, yeah, there's a lot going on there. And then there is something called the husband stitch, which is practiced by some today. Uh, it's controversial about how frequent it actually happens, which it's hard to say. But uh, the idea there is that um, during childbirth, it is entirely possible for the external genitalia to tear somewhat. And when that happens, it is uh, medically justified to stitch up that area. There's something called the husband stitch, which is an extra stitch to uh, make things tighter down there in the idea that it will be more pleasurable for the partner with the penis. And it's called the husband stitch. It's a super gross name for a super gross thing. And I'm, I'm going to keep that gross name for it. But um, that that is done to uh, people without their knowledge or consent and can cause complications, uh, just as uh, Dr. Burt ruined a lot of people's lives with his the complications that he created, and, and not to mention the, the trauma of, of enduring that. One thing I want to emphasize here is that like the very nature of sex, which is to say like intercourse of penis and vagina, uh, that itself is a social construct. And I'm going to say that again. Sex itself is a social construct. They're not like, obviously, there are people who don't engage in penis and vagina sexual intercourse, and uh, they are still engaging in sex. And there's a lot of different I ideas and, and meanings uh, to the word sex for people based on, you know, whatever activities they're engaging in. But all that is to say that we cannot remove the this the medical information and the science from the the social context that we're in um, and we need to understand one and the other and if we try to go into these things not understanding that we are influenced by white supremacist heterosis patriarchal capitalist domination culture we're just going to enforce it in incredibly violent ways, the way that these people did. A couple things to add. Uh, some There's some quotations here, um, also from the book Fruit of Knowledge. The revelation by Masters and Johnson, famous uh, sex researchers, that the female orgasm is almost entirely clitoral would have been commonplace wisdom to every 17th century midwife. Again, midwives and many people before them and and some people after uh, were way more familiar with uh, the the human body than the general public is today and even many doctors many medically trained people and then one one point I want to emphasize too in the conversation around genital cutting is it it does happen to male infants or or uh, infants with penises I'm not in favor of that and I you know I, I condemn it and there is something different about, quote unquote, female circumcision versus, quote unquote, male circumcision. So I'm going to read this quote from a paper uh, that I have, have sourced in the notes here, which is, female circumcision reflects an underlying message about the status of women and an intention to affect their sexual function and behavior. Importantly, male circumcision does not intend to affect the male's future sexual behavior or communicate a lower status of males. So it's there is actually history in the male circumcision being rooted in this idea that it would decrease masturbation so you know you can argue that it was originally designed to affect male sexual behavior um but that's certainly not the the primary reason it's performed today which you know there it's like there's talk around it having medical benefits but if it does it's super minor and and I would certainly argue not not worth the pain and trauma that I imagine an infant would be going through. But it does not have this subjugation of a person based on their gender the way that, quote unquote, female circumcision does. Um, 
not to mention that female circumcision is has far more complications associated with it afterward um and it it is entirely uh rooted in altering sexual behavior there there's no argument at all about uh having any health benefits so while I am against genital cutting of any kind, I do think that uh, the genital cutting of the clitoris or general vulva or quote unquote female circumcision carries with it more oppression behind it. And, uh, and I think that that is, is worth emphasizing. So that is the history of uh, patriarchy and genital medicine and science by time. And now just to go through some notes here, the lower left corner here is uh, around sex and socialism in general and uh, some of the stuff that you can find from my sex bio or me personally. And then over here in the corner uh, or on the right side, there's uh, some of the main sources I pulled from. Behind the Bastards is that podcast that emphasizes uh, the ex-doctor who uh, performed those clitoridectomies. I'm going to add in the one about uh, Harvey Kellogg as well. And then I'll also emphasize that Fruit of Knowledge comic book again. The OBGYN reacts as a great uh, OBGYN YouTuber. And that period podcast, it's a podcast dedicated to the menstruation and understanding it. And it's it's super, super fascinating. A lot of things I myself did not know and, and would not have learned from just living my life generally. But, you know, I'm trying to uh, to understand experiences that I don't typically have. And then I do think uh, it's important, especially for people like me, heterosis men, to engage in art uh, that emphasizes and, and praises, quote unquote, female anatomy, like Pussy Riot and Little Kim, and being able to say those words um, and, and do so. I mean, if you think about like women having to accustom themselves to love songs written by men and movies written by men and stories written by men, I think there is a benefit to us heterosis men doing that with art written by women in uh, no uncertain terms. And then some articles here, again, trying to emphasize that these things do happen in the U.S. And child marriage kept coming up whenever I was looking at these kinds of uh, articles and information, so I included that there. But then the second page of resources. This is entirely dedicated to female genital cutting and uh, a lot of really good stuff, especially videos from people who have been cut, which I think is important to hear their voices and to to center them in this conversation. And uh, yeah, whatever, whatever style of information you most appreciate, whether it's podcast, video, article, or, or what have you, I've got you covered. So this has been My Sex Bio's May edition of Fucking Capitalism, Patriarchy and Genital Science and Medicine. Thank you so much for coming, if he, or, or watching rather, if you were to have attended, because again, this is a, a I facilitate conversations here. So if you if you attended, the questions that I would have posed to you for the breakout groups were would be these two questions. So first I would ask you, what forces have shaped your relationship to your own genitalia? And then we would break out into a group and talk about that. Um, and that might be, you know, your personal genitalia, or that could be all genitalia that quote unquote, looks like yours, uh, whatever that means. And, uh, and we would talk about that and have that discussion. Then the other question if for the breakout group is, what forces have shaped your relationship to other genitalia, genitalia that is not your own? And that could be any genitalia not your own or uh, genitalia that uh, doesn't look like yours. And, and we would discuss that. A big part of the series here on fucking capitalism is to make those connections from the grander political economy systems to our own personal lives. And so that's uh, typically the way it works is that I give this kind of presentation and then we have these discussions trying to like bring it in, make it personal. So that's the idea. Again, my name is Pierce Delahunt and I so appreciate your watching. Please do check out our offerings at My Sex Bio or, um, or what I have to offer from my articles or videos or whatever. So, so grateful for y'all and solidarity because there's a lot that we need to to work toward um and change i appreciate your your doing that thank you